Good morning, church. If you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. This morning, we're, we're kicking off a brand new series in the second half of the book of Daniel, kind of through this theme that we would entitle Control in Chaos. Anyone ever experienced chaos? And everyone ever met a two-year-old? <laughs> Lived in Gulf Breeze for the last four years. The land of the orange cones. You could almost like follow the orange cones, follow the orange That's where we are, chaos. Well, the first six chapters, we learned so much. I think through the life example of Daniel and his friends, of what life can look like under the authority of God. Someone who is surrendered first and foremost to him, and then them, but first him. And when someone chooses to say, I will live under the authority of God, surrendered, that begins over time to become very counter to the culture. But does that make sense? If it doesn't, you can read Daniel chapter 1 through 6 and go, oh, there it is, it makes sense. Um, in this series, here's what we're seeking to learn. One simple truth. How do I live in a place, learn to lead a life of serenity in the midst of chaos? So much of life, if, it, if I can have your attention on this, is out of your control. So much of life is. That's why this prayer really resonates with me. Let me read it to you. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Anyone ever heard that before? You, many of you. Wow. Life can be, and, and please hear this. It can be, and oftentimes genuinely is, chaotic. Things may be happening that you or I or we may wish weren't. There may be a situation in which we want change, but feel powerless or, in effect, are powerless to affect change. It's beyond my ability to control this. Life can be chaotic, and so what do we desire? Control. This is chaos. There must be order. Did anyone ever play this game as a kid? Do you know this game? How do, how do you pronounce it? See, yes, there's different pronunciations. There's Jenga and Jenga. I don't know which one it is, but whatever it is, you know what this is. This, my dear friends, is this. Let me show you what this is. This is neatly stacked in here, and it never falls over. It just stays right where you want it to. Jenga is like this. Even a knife in there. It's chaos. Like when you, you have this game with these blocks that you're seeking to take and stack them in this little cardboard thing and then make a tower and then, for those of us that struggle with OCD, this is a major challenge. A major challenge. Because we're like, ah! And then one thing, and it's just a stressful game. Life is stressful enough. Why do we need Jenga introduced into our lives? I don't get it. Like, this is not my game. I don't even, I don't like this game. It's not the game that I would have. That's not my style. But life can be like Jenga, Jenga, whatever you call it to be. Chaos. Chaos. How can we have control in chaos? Daniel chapter 7 through 12 will show you. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Listen to Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. Well, what will we see? Well, I think all of us would love to get to a place where we could finally go like this. 
The blocks are stacked. They're not moving. The dust is settled. I've arrived. I'm safe. I don't have to think anymore. I can just live in a rut. I mean a rhythm, right? I can just live on a cul-de-sac. Same thing every Monday. Same thing every Tuesday. Same thing every Wednesday. Same thing every Thursday. Life is meant to be lived linear, not in a circle. You're on a journey of going forward. Therefore, what was yesterday is yesterday. It's over. It's done. Let it go. The position you had yesterday was yesterday. The people that were in your life yesterday, it was yesterday. Where are you today? That's what matters. See, here's the deal. If you're hoping in this series, oh, great, we're going to learn how to live in control when it's chaos. Let me put something up on the screen and totally disappoint you. Here it is. It is not our goal to be in control, but to have self-control because we know and trust who is ultimately in control. This series is actually about self-control in the midst of chaos. Not you learning. How can I control? How can I manipulate? How can I force this? How can I? You know, I have six children. Here's something I've learned. When they are young, they need control. Do not take the fork and put it in the outlet. They do not need influence at age two. Dear, sweet, lovable child, don't take the dingle hopper and put it in the outlet. No. No, you don't do that. You use the word no quite often. But here's what I've learned when childhood is done, and it does end. And then there's this season called adolescence. Anyone ever been through adolescence? You know about that? You've heard about it? And that's when the currency must change from control to influence. Not overnight. You still have to have control. But if you use control language like you did at age two and say, well, from 12 to 22, I'm using the same language, it's not going to work. You need a currency exchange of control to influence. But it's not overnight. I think it's from like age 12 to 22. Does that make sense? Where this is what's changing. You're beginning to say, hey, I'm not your friend. I'm your parent. But I want to be your friend. And I want to be able to parent you through adolescence so that one day we can be friends. And I want to do it in a friendly way. But my role is a role of influence, Lord willing. Like with a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, they need control. I'm not saying a 12, 13 through sometimes 72 still needs an element of control. Please mis don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But if you wait too long and they go, gosh, i got to control my 19-year-old, good luck with that, man. That ain't going to work. The goal is to learn to live self-controlled because we know who ultimately is in control. Now, we're in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. If you're there, can you let me know by saying God is in control? Let me read verse 1 of chapter 7. Reading from the New Living Translation, this is Daniel. He says, Earlier during the first year of Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he laid in his bed of sugar plums and fair... No, no, no. He wrote down the dream, and this is what he saw. Chapter 6 to chapter 7, there's a change. We were getting story time about Daniel's life in chapter 1 through 6. Chapter 7 says he had a vision. This is different. Many people that teach the book of Daniel, they stop at chapter 6 because they go, chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, that's chaos. Who wants to touch that? Daniel 1 through 6 describes a life surrendered. Daniel 7 through 12 describes visions that Daniel has that take place during the timeline of life between chapters 4 and 5. This vision came to Daniel after the reign of the Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar, but during the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire. Today, chapter 7, is the first vision of four. How many? There's going to be four visions. How many visions are in Daniel chapter 7 through 12? Do you happen to know? Quattro, four. There's four. Today we're looking at one. But here's what I need to say. 
This is the most comprehensive of the four visions. So it's kind of rainy outside. It's kind of warm. Maybe you got your coffee. You're thinking, man, this is going to be a great sermon just to sleep through. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, this sermon is going to be intense. Like we're going to go all the way through chapter 7. I went to Bible college. Like you spend weeks upon weeks in chapter 7. We're going to spend about 30 minutes together. So let me share this. There will be a lot of gold left upon the ground for you to pick up in your own study. Does that make sense? My heart and hope this morning, through this time together, is that you will see that God is in control and that you will be reminded that you can live self-controlled. I want you to be reminded. That's why we make these little bracelets. I need these reminders. The people of the Old Testament needed reminders, things tied around their garments to remind them of God's truth. But also it's open doors to share God's truth. I want you to be able to live self-controlled in the midst of chaos. Because chaos is coming for you. It's coming for you. And you don't have to allow chaos to lead you. You can be self-controlled because you know that God is in control. So here's what we'll do in the remainder of the time that we have together. We are going to consider the text, all 28 verses of it, in one big chunk. I'm going to read all of Daniel chapter 7. We'll consider the context. What's going on here? We'll consider the content of the context and the text, and then here's where we'll land. I just want to share three. How many? Three Three takeaway truths that I'm hoping will be like this. Do you know what this is? It rhymes with mandal. It's a handle. Takeaway truths are a handle for you to go, I got it. God's in control. You may not remember all the content I'm about to share. You may not remember the context. You may not remember all 28 verses. But I'm hoping to give you three handles, takeaway truths, to say, okay, I see from Daniel 7. Here's how I can apply this. Now, I am a terrible reader. Anyone else in, like that in life? Like, I'm an auditorial, a visual learner, and I like to get the lesson quickly, if, if I can. I would love for Jerry to read the book and tell me about the book. Does that make sense? So here's what I've done. I wrote out word for word the notes that I'll share today. If you're someone that would like, boy, that guy, what was he talking about? There's notes in the back and online that you can take. Oh, there's those three truths. I had to sit for 45 minutes for him to finally get to them, but there they are. Uh, Because I want to make sure I'm not giving you handles without the appropriate context. Does that make sense? I don't want to give you tweetable. Well, I guess tweeting's not a thing anymore, but like, I don't want to give you one-liners that rhyme and that are alliterated. They go, where is that in the Bible? I want you to be able to go, that's why it is. I see it. That's what we'll do today. So let's read the text, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 through 28. And like Rob did, I am going to do, but I I mean it this time. Can we stand together as we read the text? I'd like to read Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 through 28. It's intense. You might sleep through it. That's why I need you to stand. It's more challenging to sleep when you're standing. So let's read through this text. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into the context, the content, and the takeaway truths. Here it is. We've already read verse 1, so let me read verse 2. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first like a lion with eagle's wings. And as I watched, its wings were pulled off. And it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground like a human being. And it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast, and I looked like a bear, and I was rearing up on the one side and three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four birds' wings on its back and four heads, and great authority was given to this beast. Then in my vision that night I saw a fourth beast, terrifying 
dreadful, very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I watched as thrones were put in place, and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels, millions of angels ministered to him, and many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its sessions, and the books were opened, and I continued to watch because I could hear the horn's boastful speech. I kept hearing, I kept watching, I'm sorry, until the fourth beast was killed. Its body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a while longer. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the Son of Man. Someone like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into His presence. He was given authority and honor and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey Him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, slept through this. No, he says, I was troubled by all I had seen. My visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. And he explained it like this. Look at verse 17. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom, and they will rule forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others and so terrifying. It had devoured and crushed its victims with iron teeth and bronze claws, trampling their remains beneath its feet. I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast's head and a little horn that came up afterward and destroyed the three of the other horns. This horn had seemed greater than the others, and it had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against God's holy people and was defeating them until the Ancient One, The Most High came and judged in favor of His holy people. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. Verse 23, then He said, The fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever, and all the rulers will serve and obey him. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts, and my face was pale with fear. But I kept these things to myself. Okay, you got it? God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Okay, let's pray. We need to pray. Lord, that is a lot there. Give me the ability to serve your people well in the time that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible is a unique book in that it deals with both history and prophecy, what has happened and what is to come. And in the past, some have made predictions that don't pan out. Anyone ever heard of Western Union? Yes. 1876, this came out from Western Union. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. This device is inherently of no value to us. 
They are known as the blockbuster of the 20th century now. <laughs> IBM. Anyone know about IBM? You heard about that? I think there is a world market for maybe five computers, the chairman of IBM once said, Thomas Watson, or the record company executive for Decca Records in 1962. Listen to what he said. We don't like their sound. We don't think the Beatles will ever do anything. In fact, guitars are on their way out. But the Bible has proven to give us prophecy that translates into reality. There are sections in which we look back when you're in the Bible. And there are sections to which we look forward. Daniel chapter 7. Does it look back? Does it look forward? Yes. Yes. It looks back and it looks forward. For him, in his vantage point... Most of everything was future. For us, in our vantage point, it's both history and a mystery. There's some that has not yet been fulfilled. See, when we consider God, He is creator. You are created. When we consider the eternal one, The one who has no beginning, no end. The uncaused causer. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. What does that even mean? Here's what it's like. Let's say you and I, we go to a parade. But we show up a little late. And the opening act, it was clowns on bicycles. We missed it. We miss the clowns. And at the end of the parade is the mayor and his float. And a friend finds us, and they said, man, I want to go see the clowns. Here's what you could say. Well, we missed it, but if you go up ahead, you can see what is past. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, I want to see the mayor's float. And you could say, well, it hasn't come yet, but if you go to the end, you can see what's to come. Now, imagine you and I get a drone, and we just go up above. We would see everything at once. Does that make sense? Everything in a single moment. Daniel chapter 7 is a drone. Does that make sense? There's so much time and history and things of mystery that are discussed here, and it's like goulash. And you're like, what is, what is going on here? How, how does he see, what is he saying? Well, in 28 verses... He's seeing past, present, and future. And he's seeing, if I can put it to you in this way, three sets of kingdoms. Let's put them up on the screen. He's showing to us three kingdoms, but they're not linear in even their description. Do you see the verses there? How How in 1 through 7, and then 15 through 23, and 11 through 12, and 21 through 26, and 9 through 14. He's talking about three kingdoms. This is the context of the text that you're in. Now what I would like to do in the brief amount of time that we have is unpack these three kingdoms in the abridged version. Do you know what the unabridged means? It means Bible college. Abridged means a sermon. Like, oh, here's just what we're talking about. The kingdoms of this world, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, we have an explanation. Verses 15 through 23 were given a description, an explanation and a description of these four animals that represent kingdoms. Now listen, please tune in here. How many have ever heard of uh, chapter 2 of the book of Daniel? If not, you're hearing about it right now for the first time. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Who knows? But which comes first, chapter 2 or chapter 7? Chapter 2. Well, why do I say that? Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, we are seeing a description of the same kingdoms, but in different ways. Do you remember the vision of the multi-metallic man in the four kingdoms? That's what we saw there. Remember this. Well, this vision of Daniel represents the same four kingdoms. Let's use this next slide to highlight that. They're the same. 
but described from a different vantage point, a different imagery. It's kind of like going to the movies. This is the same plot from the 80s, but it's 2020. Like they're going to reboot Lord of the Rings. What else can they do? They're out of things to do. It's like you're hearing the same thing, but from a different vantage point. The lion with the wings of an eagle, Babylon, in which Nebuchadnezzar was the image of the head of gold. A description of a lion being lifted up to stand like a man and given a man's heart reminds us of how God humbled King Nebuchadnezzar and made him live like a beast for seven years. The bear with three ribs in his mouth, the Medo-Persian Empire. The bear was raised up on one side. The Persians were stronger than the Medes. The ribs most likely, likely, represent Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. And the Medo-Persian Empire armies were well known. They overwhelmed their opponents with strength and size. The leopard with four wings. Each animal is mighty, but dominates its prey in a different way. The lion devours, the bear crushes, and the leopard springs upon its prey. Alexander the Great went so incredibly fast. One author put it this way, Nothing in history of the world was equal to the conquest of Alexander, who ran through the countries. And then the beast identified with the four, four heads and four horns. Well, Alexander died without a successor. His kingdom divided into four parts to four leaders. And then this dreadful and terrible beast of Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, the Roman Empire, as strong and as enduring as iron, as uncompromising as the beast on a rampage, the Roman Empire was the most unified and enduring of all the kingdoms. And that first set of kingdoms, in Daniel 7, we see all three. Do you, do you understand? Does this make sense? Maybe at this point you need to see a picture of like a, like a baby or a little puppy or a bunnies or something like that. To go, okay, I don't know what he's talking about, but I know what a bunny is. Like maybe I know what a little kid is or something like that. Is this, is this making sense? Do you know where we are? We're seeing the kingdom, as it were, of this world. Next, we're going to see the kingdom of Satan. Remember, there's three kingdoms expressed in Daniel chapter 7. The kingdoms of this world. Second, the kingdom of Satan. What's interesting is that verse 12 indicates that each kingdom exists in some way with the succeeding kingdom devouring it. It says that in verse 12. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a while longer. Daniel saw that the last human kingdom on earth would be a frightful kingdom. You remember when we read this, when he's all seeing, he says, I'm terrified. Like the color in my face is literally gone when I see what's coming for you. Like things are going to get darker. They're not going to get better. They're going to get worse. Welcome to church. No, I mean like, but this is what he's saying, that things are going to get darker. The last human kingdom on earth will be frightful, unlike anything the world's ever seen. They will even declare war upon God. This is the kingdom of Antichrist described in Revelation 13 through 19 and will be destroyed when Jesus Christ returns. Daniel mentions three things here to unpack very quickly. He says ten horns. It's in verses 7 through 8 and verse 24, representing ten kingdoms. These ten kings don't have a literal fulfillment in the Roman empire of history. If they are literal, then they're still in the future tense. And Daniel wrote in language that the people of his day could understand. See, concepts of nations as we have today would have been foreign to them. In Daniel's day, kings ruled countries, but kingdoms spoken of here would be nations as we know them now. It is out of this future confederation of ten nations in which there is some extension of the ancient Roman Empire. In that setting, the Antichrist will come. A final world kingdom will be organized, and it will be opposed to, listen, don't miss this, it will be opposed to you. 
How? Do you know one of the most shaping forms of communication in the world today? Entertainment. Give them circus and give them bread. That's what the emperors knew. Distract them. Distract them. Entertainment is so important. It is the primary shaper of our culture, I believe, today. And not all entertainment is for your good. The second thing is this little horn of verse 8, 11, and 24 through 26, which represents a world ruler. Anti means against or instead of, a counterfeit. And this Antichrist comes to overcome three other rulers and do what Satan has planned for him to do. Daniel doesn't go into all the details that John would share in the book of Revelation, but he does say that the kingdom of Satan is a counterfeit Christ. What does that mean? Has the form of godliness, but denies the power. It becomes more about entertainment, more about entertaining than training God's people. That's dangerous. And then the third thing is this war on the saints, referring to the people of God living on the earth. And there's more in the notes for you to reference there. But these are the things that are mentioned about the kingdom of Satan. And thirdly, before we get to kind of our takeaway truths for today, he talks about the kingdom of God. See, Daniel has seen the rise and fall in chapter 7 of the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the kingdom of Satan. But the most important kingdom is the kingdom that Christ will establish And Daniel mentions two things, a heavenly throne and the Ancient of Days. Do you remember seeing that? When he's like, oh, the Ancient of Days is there. And then he talks about the Son of Man and an earthly throne. You see, the heavenly throne of the Father, the Ancient of Days, is a name for God that emphasizes his eternality. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the God who has existed from eternity past, has planned all things, and is working out his plan. God doesn't have a body, wear clothes, or grow white hair. These things are symbolic of his nature and character. He's eternal. He's holy. He's sovereign. The earthly throne of the Son of God, or Son of Man, is a familiar title of who? It rhymes with the name Jesus. Do you know the name? Some of you know the name of Jesus. That's so good. In the Gospels, he often referred himself to as the Son of Man. Used 82 times in the Gospels, often by Jesus. And let me share with you what Warren Wearsby says about this. You know, anytime I need help sometimes understanding the Bible, I always go to www.warrenwendellwearsby. Isn't that interesting that his name is www? I just thought that was interesting. Okay, here's what he says. The Son of Man is presented before the throne of the Father and given dominion over all nations, an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. Unlike the previous four kingdoms in the kingdom of Antichrist, the kingdom of Jesus can never be removed or destroyed. This is the kingdom of God he had in mind when he told David that his throne would never end. He will share this kingdom with his people. They shall reign with him. And in this dramatic vision... Daniel has seen this this vast sweep of history, beginning with the Babylonians and closing with the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Now, I know what you might be thinking. I know why you called this series Control and Chaos, because, Neil, this sermon is chaos. I don't know what you're talking about. All these kingdoms, these beasts, this statue. I wasn't here for Daniel chapter 2. I I don't know where. What are you talking about? Listen, here's my goal for you this morning and the six minutes we have left together. I want you to do well in life. You're going to do well in life with a surrendered heart, a learning mind, and a thick skin. 
And everything that I've shared this morning so far has been the text. We read it, 28 verses. A little bit of context. A little bit, just a little, little, little bit of explanation of the content. That what this is talking about is three kingdoms. But listen, even this chapter is a little bit like Jenga or Jenga or however you say it. We're like, okay, I see this kingdom, I see this kingdom, and then over here there's a description, over here there's an explanation. This one's like this, it builds on this, it absorbs that one. Oh, then there's ten. You could spend semesters and semesters unpacking Daniel chapter 7. And if you're so inclined, go for it. It's awesome. It will feed your soul. It'll form your mind. It'll fortify your resolve to keep moving forward. How do I know that? Because I want to give you, like I shared with you, three handles, three simple things. Here's the first one. Often, God's instruction comes through what? What does it say up there in yellow? Repetition. What word is it? Wait, I didn't get it. What word is it? Okay, did you see what I just did? Like, repetition. Often, God's instruction comes through rhythms, rut, rot, or revival. Those are your choices. Well, how do I be revived? Rhythms. I'm in God's Word daily. Don't you wish there was a church that loved you so much that they put forth a video devotional every weekday so you could wake up and get on there and get into your rhythm of God's Word? Man, that would be awesome if there was a church that cared about you that much. I wish there was. Often God's instruction comes through repetition. What do you mean? Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, same thing. A little bit different explanation, a little bit gnarlier, a little bit more details, but the same thing. The same thing. We know that repetition often brings instruction. You say, what do you mean about, what do you mean? Think about our educational system. As you move from grade to grade, you build on a foundation of things that you've learned. And you often repeat fundamentals by building upon them. Does that make sense? Like in, 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 in uh, second grade, did anyone make it through the second grade? I can't tell if everyone here really did. I don't really know. Did everyone here make it through? No one in the back left. Okay. We got Coastline Christian Academy for all you guys. No. When you went through the second grade, you had a math class, right? Fifth grade, did you have a math class? Eighth grade? Why do we have to keep learning math? We learned it in the second. Because you're building upon it. You're building upon rhythms. Anyone here, you don't have to raise your hand on this, been a Christian for six months or less? Great. Six years or less? Great. 16, 26, 36, 46, 56. Here's what I want to share with you. You still need God's word. Still need prayer. Still need to be sharing your faith. Still need to be giving and serving and learning and praying and singing. Those ten values. You don't graduate from them. You build upon them. Day by day. Someone once asked me, Neil, how long did it take you to prepare that sermon? 42 years, 8 months, and I'm still building. We learn through repetition. That's what's happening in this passage. In marriage, it seems like it always comes back to a few things. Husbands, die. Prefer your wife over yourself. Die. Put her first. Sacrificially love her. You will be challenged in that in every way. Spouse, wife, respect and allow him to lead. Ooh, those are, man, you could you feel the tension? Like you're like, man, those are, I don't want to hear that. Like, no, that's, that's the rhythms of marriage. And communicate, communicate, communicate in verbal and nonverbal cues. Love and respect one another. In parenting, you, you know about rhythms, but you have to have them. Think about the Word of God. Let me share this illustration with you. We'll put it up on the screen about the book of Judges, the people of God in the time of the book of Judges. Seven times went through this cycle. Sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance, peace. You don't have to raise your hand, but do you see any parallels in your own life? i got to get back to church. Oh, we're good. We got to go back to church. Oh, i got to get back to church. This is the cyclical dynamic, and God is teaching people. Jesus with his disciples 
calming the storm, walking on water, feeding the 5,000. What is God showing in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? God is faithful. Let me put it to you this way. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to you, yeah, over and over. It is impossible to please God without showing up to church every single Sunday. Isn't that what the Bible says? It is impossible to please God without giving everything you have to the poor. It is impossible to please God without, it rhymes with maith. Faith. Many sit on the pine pony of analyzation due to fear. I won't step out. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work out? What if I talk to someone and they don't talk back to me? What if, what if I try and invest my time, my money, my resources in this and it goes flat? You've already failed because failure is to sit and to do nothing. Failure is to do nothing. See, falling is not failure. Failure is failing to get up. Everyone falls. Thank God for the Edison guy that he fell a lot or you'd be sitting in the dark right now. You don't have to be a failure. It's not what God's designed you to be. He's designed you to move forward. How do I do that? I take a step of, it rhymes with Maith Church, what is it? Faith. You're never going to graduate from ventures in faith. Never. And if you have, then you're just waiting to be buried. You're dead. You're not going anywhere. Because life with God is a life lived by faith. And often God's instruction comes through repetition. Let me ask this question. What instruction is God bringing, in, bringing into your life over and over and again? Are you listening? Trust Him. Listen to Him. Obey Him. That's how you have control in the midst of chaos. Not by doing this. Well, I'm just going to try and get as much of this in here as I can. There's more Bible study, more Bible study, more Bible study. That's good to a point. But do you know why we listen to the Word of God? So that we can learn the Word of God. Yes, yes, yes. But why? So that we're not lame, loco, lazy. So that it translates into an attitude, into actions. We learn the Word of God so that we can live the Word of God. How do we live? By faith. By faith. The secret to life is to live Right where you are. Right, Ugwe? Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a... Live right where you are. If you have breath in your lungs, there's purpose for you. Glorious purpose. Step into it. Open your eyes. And see that God has something for you now. And if you're holding on to what she did or what he said or how this didn't work, you are not living. You're just surviving. And God's design for you is thriving in Him in seasons of rest and recovery and rhythms. But it will not happen unless you take a step of faith. Everyone here has a next step. Everyone in this room, on this stage, on the other side of that camera, you have a next step in your journey with God. He hasn't called you to live on the Christian cul-de-sac. I'll just do the same thing every week. No. Take ventures of faith. Second, take away truth. Let me put it to you this way. It's very simple. It doesn't rhyme. It's not even alliterated, but here it is. We've been given the word of God. When a ship is in the midst of a chaotic storm, what keeps it stable? The rudder. And the word of God has been given to us so that when things are chaotic, what do we do? We go back to these truths. Greater is he who is in me than is in the world. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Behold, I am coming, the Lord says, to establish a new heaven and a new earth where every tear will be wiped away. The word of God forms and fashions you to be able to do this. I can stay self-controlled even though things are out of control because I know who's in control. 
because of the Word of God. The better you know this book, the more at peace you will be in life. But not in an academic pursuit, a faith pursuit. One that translates from the 18 inches from here to here to here. And let me just share one other place. To here. If this doesn't change the way your face looks, something's wrong. If people see you and go, ooh, that's a bummer. Like, that's not, that's not you. That's not the aroma of Christ. It's the aroma of death, you know. An attitude is like an aroma. It permeates all around you. Often God's instruction comes through repetition. We've been given the word of God. And let me just share one last takeaway truth. It's very simple. Jesus, this is what's happening for you. Jesus is coming back again. So how do I know all that? Daniel chapter 7. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Don't listen to me. Well, I mean, listen to what I'm saying here is what I'm saying. But read the Bible, and this is what I'm trying to share with you. This is what I wanted to share with you. This is pretty powerful. The second coming is dealt with 1,845 times in the Bible. That means one out of every 30 verses either mentions the second coming or the last days. 20 to 25% of the Scripture refers to it. And there are preachers that would say, no, 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 the millennial reign of Christ, it's, it's a little bit more spiritual. Just focus on the rhythms right now. It's dangerous. It's the form of godliness but denying its power. Seven out of ten chapters in the New Testament refer to the second coming. For every one mention of his first coming, there are at least eight times mentioned of his second. Every, one, every time the atonement is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned twice. And Jesus personally referred to his second coming 21 times. And no less than 50 times in the Bible are we told this one phrase, Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. He came first to deal with sin as a Savior. He comes second to take over, to rule. And here's what I would say. My hope and prayer for you is that these truths of the Word of God form and fashion your life. And I'm convinced that if you are listening, if you have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to Coastline Gulf Breeze, by the end of May, you will be trained as to how to live self-controlled because you know that God is in control. What could God do with 400 people that live self-controlled? He could probably change the world. What could he do with four? It's a lot more than he's doing today. It's like that old story my dad always tells about the farmer with a beautiful garden. You've heard this. When someone comes up to the farmer and to compliment him upon the Everything that's going on in his farm, his garden, the rows and the production and the organization and how many people are benefiting from. And he goes, my goodness, isn't God good? And the farmer says, absolutely he is. Look at what all God has done through your farm. God is so good. He goes, he is good. And you should have seen what God was doing with the land without me. What does that mean? God wants to work in partnership with you. Do you know that there will be work in heaven? I firmly believe it. Work is not the enemy. How do I know that? Because it, it wasn't given in Genesis chapter 3. Chapters 1 and 2, when God gives man a job description, he says, this is the earth, subdue it. What does that mean, destroy it? No, tend to it, care for it, steward it, make, make it produce. You are most alive when you are contributing to something, when you're serving if you're sitting, no wonder you're bummed. You become like those two guys in the Muppets. You know what I mean? Like, that's what happens to critics. But if you're engaged, then you're engaged. You're alive. How do I do that? Those 10 values sing, serve, give, learn, pray. Come to know Jesus first and foremost. Profess that through baptism. And then find out how you're wired and gifted. The community around you will help you. Hey, I think I should be this. Oh, I don't think so, bro. Like, I know you. I live with you. That's not what you're good at. Like, 
other people around you will help you. I think I should be this. Well, what does your people around you say? They say no. Well, maybe you should listen to them. I want you to do well. And my, I don't think it's a theory. My thesis is that you will be able to live self-controlled in a world that is not because you know God who is in control. So you can stay self-controlled when things are out of control because you know God who is in control. How do I know God? Because his instruction comes through repetition. You've been given the word of God and Jesus is coming back again. Amen?